basically. And my first experience there was uh, to work about gender equity and uh, advocacy on um, women's problems, especially reproductive health. That was because of my background as a medical doctor. I'm a medical doctor by training uh, and specialize in family medicine. I did a lot of journalism as well. Um, so with all that uh, different uh, types of experience, I ended up in corporate uh, communications. And uh, for the last eight years, I am leading the public affairs department of Eurasia and Africa group in Coca-Cola, which oversees 90 countries. About 85% of the Muslim communities on the, in the world uh, are in fact in Eurasia and Africa group, which is headquartered in Istanbul. Um, and uh, we not only do business, but very strongly engage in uh, many social issues of the communities that we operate in. And one of the leading flagship uh, programs that we are focusing in the recent years is uh, a program what we called as 5 by 20, which is a big commitment uh, talking about empowering 5 million women by 2020 in our supply chain. So we will try to touch base on that topic as well. Uh, but the point there is sometimes the corporates or the governments uh, provide empowerment opportunities for women or other parts of the community, not only by direct employment, by empowering them through skills or uh, providing them access to um, some entrepreneurship opportunities. I think that's enough for me, and now I will um, introduce uh, our dis distinguished guest here, Shalina Jan Mohammed. She is the vice president of Ogilvy Noor, and already uh, when I um, heard about her participation, I was very excited because of a very um, famous book she had, an award-winning book. And uh, I will also ask Shalina to talk about that as well during the course of this discussion. It's uh, very interesting. Um, Shalina is the vice president of Ogil Vinur, as I said, the world's uh, uh, very important global Islamic branding uh, practice for building brands in the, uh, for the Muslim consumers. She has a fantastic uh, research that we will talk today. Uh, she's an uh, established author and thinker uh, of Muslim women's rights, social and religious trends as well. She was named one of the world's 500 most influential Muslims and specifically one of the UK's 100 most powerful Muslim women. Her award-winning uh, book that I just mentioned, Love in a um, Handscarf, uh, is a humorous and very nice uh, book. I only read two pages, I have to admit. I will do it uh, after the discussion. But already two of my uh, friends in the audience, they uh, shared that they have uh, read and they really enjoyed. Uh, she writes her own weekly column uh, for the National, the Middle East leading English uh, language newspaper, focusing on trends affecting the success of women. Uh, and. Um, with all this um, very uh, important knowledge, she will have a lot to share with us. Should we start with the book, in fact, uh, before going to the uh, search, uh, research and the analysis? As you wish. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yeah, let's talk about the book. This is it. Um, so uh, what was the reactions uh, after that? I mean, I understand, I read the, uh, the dialogue between the people who read it. Uh, in fact, there was a very engaging uh, forum between a, a headscarfed woman in Turkey and a guy who, in fact, didn't think highly about women uh, wearing head, uh, headscarves. And then that discussion was a good education sharing, educating each other about um, you know, the dilemmas and uh, uh, talking about individual um, you know, experiences and how being uh, carrying a, a religious identity would impact that. Well, the story behind the book, can you all hear me at the back? 
Um, the story behind the book was um, that I, I was born and grew up in London um, as a Muslim, and um, you'll all be familiar when July 7th happened. And I would become increasingly frustrated that the discussion in the media wasn't really listening to what Muslim women themselves had to say. Um, they would talk about Muslim women, um, or they would talk about women, and I think that's an experience that we can all share. Um, and I just thought that it was really important for somebody who could understand both the, the Muslim aspect as well as what it was like to live in the West to actually have a say in that discussion. And that's one of the great lessons from, from writing and from um, publishing the book, that if you want to change the discussion, you have to actually enter into the discussion. So I started blogging, which was very popular at the time. And, um, and I would get people writing to me saying, oh, you know, we really love, we, this is exactly what we want people to understand about being a Muslim woman. Can you write a book about it? And I would just sort of think, and this is really typical of women, I would just go, well, my life is very dull and very boring. Why would anyone want to read about my book? Um, that's for celebrities and politicians. And I remember one day I went into the local bookshop where I lived and they had a display of books about Muslim women. And, uh, and they had all these pictures you'll all be familiar with, you know, kind of veils and very sad-looking eyes and camels in the background. Um, and, you know, titles like Kidnapped, Sold, Slavery. And, uh, and I just thought, none of these stories is my story. Where is my story in all of these, these tales? And that's what inspired me to go out and write the book. And I've heard a lot of entrepreneurs... Um, a lot of women particularly talk about the fact that if you see a problem, if you see something that you feel is not right, you should be the solution to that problem. And that's essentially where my book came from. Um, and what I wanted to write was not a counter to all those sad stories because one of the things I've also learned is to change a narrative, you shouldn't just rebut it, you need a new narrative. And so what I wanted to write about was something funny, something about human emotion, something that was a universal story, and that's why I chose the story of love. And uh, how relevant it was that it was a big success and already uh, translated into several languages, I, I believe. I think what was really gratifying, what made me feel really contented was exactly this kind of conversation that you were describing, that it gave people an opportunity to talk about a very... Um, emotional issue, you know, what is Islam? What does it mean to be a Muslim woman? But in a way that was very neutral because it was somebody else's story. Um, and I have often uh, people who are not Muslim uh, or even Muslim uh, women writing to me saying things like, I talked to my daughter about this. We both read it and we had a discussion, which I think is really fantastic. Um, or people who are not Muslim writing to me saying, I never knew that this was what it was like to be a Muslim woman. And my intention is never to convert people or um, you know, try and persuade that you know, my way is the only way, but just to say, here's a story, and maybe you'll find something in it that you can connect to. And for me, that's the best thing that I can find. And, and it has been translated because I think it has that universality. So in India, it went to number two on the bestseller list. Um, it's available in Indonesia, um, Turkey, Germany, Italy, Arabic's just come out, um, and some others that I can't remember. Yeah, but that, that's been very, very um, gratifying for me. Okay, a recommendation to everyone, and uh, congratulations, Selena, for this book. And Hopefully, you will have the opportunity to uh, read this book. Um, let's go back to the topic of this discussion today. In fact, uh, we will link uh, from our um, you know, chat about the book uh, to the conversation. Uh, today, we were supposed to discuss the business uh, innovation, uh, chasing success in a shoestring. And honestly, uh, when we uh, were doing the role sort, Margaret Manning, who couldn't make it to the uh, meeting today, she was aiming to focus more about how innovation could be inexpensive, that small businesses can lead the way in innovation and entrepreneurship. And uh, one of the um, targets that she was hoping to leave um, out of this discussion was that women of any age or race can and should aspire to success both in their home country as well as internationally because they have the power to uh, innovate. Um, so we will miss uh, Margaret Manning, but uh, we will now 
uh, have the opportunity to go more in depth uh, of the um, research that Shalina has been leading recently. And as you see uh, at the chart, it says revolution unveiled, how Muslim women aren't, uh, are driving innovation. What I really liked when I uh, read the summary of this was the very easy to grasp kind of uh, analysis about the status of women, the Muslim women around the world. And I will let Shalina to talk more about this research and the summary of it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering if there's a mic I can use to stand and present. I don't know if any of... Do we have is a there one I can ha hold and stand up and present? While we're waiting for that, can I just ask how many of you in the room feel like you are innovators? Oh dear, okay, by the end, we want all the hands up. How many of you feel like you're entrepreneurs? Okay, that's pretty good. And how many of you feel like as Muslim women you're gonna change the world even in a small way? Oh, come on, everybody put your hands up. <laughs> Okay, we're going to have some ideas on how to change the world by the end of this session, hopefully. Is there going to be a mic, or shall I present sitting down? Thank you so much. Is it? Oh, you can hear me. Fantastic. So I work for an organization called Ogilvy Noor, and we are part of one of the world's largest uh, branding and advertising networks called Ogilvy and Mather, which you may be familiar with. And about a year and a half ago, Ogilvy Noor was set up primarily to look at uh, the Muslim consumer. And the idea behind this is that at the moment in the world, there are 1.8 billion Muslims. And they are part of the fastest growing economies in the world. So if you've heard of the next 11, six of them are majority Muslim countries. 43% of Muslims are under the age of 25, which makes them an extremely attractive target market for businesses and organizations. But also it means that whatever kind of organization, whether it's civic society, whether it's a commercial organization or an NGO, really needs to think very carefully about how they're going to reach out to this particular segment. And we did some research, which I'll talk you through in a second. Uh, but one of the findings from a commercial perspective, when we asked Muslims around the world about their relationship with consumption, was that they said over 90% of the Muslims we asked said that their faith affects their consumption. And for any of you who are marketers or uh, commercial officers in organization, that is a very startling figure and something that should make you sit up and take notice. So we did some research in four countries to try and get us a flavor of the Muslim world, uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, and Pakistan, according to the development cycle of the Muslim world. And as you would expect from a marketing organization, we did some segmentation to try and understand who these Muslims were, what they were like, what their attitudes were about. And one thing I should make really clear is that in our research and in what I'm going to present to you, we are not interested in how religious these Muslims are. We're not interested in levels of devotion or piety. We're just interested in how they relate to the world and what they want the world to give to them and what their attitudes and values are. And then I'm going to go on and explain how the trends around Muslim women fit into that. So what I want in the presentation to do is to really paint you a picture of where the Muslim world is today and how Muslim women fit into those wider trends. You are still with me? Great, okay. So, can you see that? Because the writing's really small. Okay, what you need to know is on the far side, this is the segmentation that we did and we conducted around Muslim consumers. And if you can't read it, then outside there are these booklets which have an extract from our study. It's called When Faith Meets Facebook. And you can actually see the segmentation in that. And essentially what we found is there are two groups. One we called the futurists and one we called the traditionalists. And for any organization, both are really important. But what we found really fascinating were these futurists. And as the name suggests, they are the ones that are setting the trends. 
They are leading the Muslim world in developing their ideas about modernity. They're, they're um, disproportionately influential, and they have a number of characteristics which I think will resonate with many people in the room. So, first and foremost, they don't see any contradiction between faith and modernity. They think both are compatible and actually both enhance each other. So that's one of the key fundamentals around these futurists. They're really confident, they're very optimistic, they're very creative, and that's one of the qualities that I'll talk about in a second. They, if they find that there isn't a product to suit their need or an organization or a social trend, they're gonna go out and build it themselves. And that's a really important trait of these futurists. They're going out in the world. Um, they're going to change it. They're not content to sit back and just let things happen. One of the big changes that we saw, and we did this research just as the Arab Spring was taking place, and we identified these futurists, um, is that they have a different relationship to authority. Um, no longer are they willing to sit back and just accept what people tell them, and hopefully that applies to many of us in the room. They are willing to engage with authority. So it's not a question of necessarily challenging in a disrespectful way, but an assertion that authority should be willing to have a dialogue, that there should be an equal conversation and that authority should be accountable to those who are in the wider population. And I think that's a really important and new trend. And now I've dropped my, my clicker. So that's a little bit about the futurists. Um, and I think I only explain this in detail to you because I think it starts to make sense of how Muslim women fit into this conversation. And again, I apologize if it's a little bit small. As somebody who looks at Muslim consumers, but also, as you heard, has a real deep interest in some of the trends affecting Muslim women, I feel very passionately that Muslim women are not just misunderstood, and I think we can talk for hours about how Muslim women aren't really understood in the wider world and in the media. I actually think they are under-understood. I don't think there are a lot of organizations, whether civic, whether governmental or commercial, who have taken the time to get to know what Muslim women actually want. Um, and part of what we'll talk about is that Muslim women also are now starting to come forward and assert what they want, and I think that's a very interesting trend. So just to go through some of the huge macro changes affecting Muslim women and the role that they're playing in society, there's increasing education. Levels of education are generally improving for Muslim women around the world. And there are statistics, for example, like in Iran and Saudi Arabia, female graduates actually outnumber male graduates. And that's a trend certainly where I am in the UK that is reflected in the Muslim community. There are more female Muslim graduates. Muslim women are better educated than their male counterparts. There's, and with education, of course, comes an increasing awareness of rights. So Muslim women are starting to learn more about what their rights and opportunities within the wider world should be. They're participating in the political process. We saw that in the Arab Spring, but we also see that replicated around the world. And that means they're also participating in the labor force. And, and I won't repeat what was said in the sessions earlier. There are more women, not enough, clearly, um, but there are more. One of the trends that's affecting Muslim women, as well as women in areas such as um, the, the East and South Asia, Southeast Asia, is there's later marriage, which actually has a huge impact on the way that social structures take place. So when women get married later, and if they're educated and employed, they have more disposable income, which means that they're more available to spend on new products and services. They do things like more traveling. Uh, they take greater participation in the social sphere. So that actually has a huge impact on the way that society is structured. And finally, one of the things that um, the chairman mentioned at the beginning is around technology and the impact that this has had, particularly on Muslim women. And there's a really interesting study that you may want to look at if you get the chance by the Dubai School of Government about the relationship between women in the Middle East and technology and whether things like Twitter and Facebook have really actually had an impact on the way women interact and engage in entrepreneurship. And what they find is that there are huge worries still about using social media in terms of reputation in societies where privacy and status is valued, but it definitely gets women past the initial hurdles of engaging in the business world. There's only so far that the study concludes that women can go using social media. At some point, they have to actually go into the real world. But those initial barriers of worry, nervousness, what will people say, which is a huge worry for women all over the world, 
actually start to disappear. The idea that you have to go into a male environment, which can be nerve-wracking for all women, um, suddenly dissolve, and there's a starting point. And I think that's very powerful and worth noting. It's just also worth uh, having a look on the, on the far side for me, is about the complexity of Muslim women's lives. And when I talk about Muslim women from a branding perspective and from a communications perspective, I think there are many aspects that you can talk about women. And certainly in the UK, this is one particular analysis. And I wouldn't even pretend that this is the only analysis. You should go away and do your own snapshot of how Muslim women are constructed as a mosaic. But certainly in the UK, you know, they have three paradigms, faith, family, community, and modern life. And actually, they want to be engaged with in many different ways in all of these different aspects. And I think it's that complexity that's really important to bring out in discussions with Muslim women. So finally, um, before we get into the discussion, when Muslim women find that there is nothing to suit their needs because they are under-understood and they're underserved, Either they demand from organizations that they listen to them, or if organizations don't innovate in order to meet their needs, Muslim women are actually going out to innovate for themselves. And I think that's really, really exciting. And there's many ways that they're doing this innovation. So when I talk about innovation, I think the initial instinct is to think about products or business methodology. But actually, even before that, it's, it's worth understanding some of the precursors to that kind of innovation. So one of them, which I think is really powerful, is around the choice of language. And there's a real shift in the way that Muslim women are, are appropriating language for themselves and then reconstituting it back into the public space. So I've pulled out a few here. I mean, fabulously halal, let's try that again. Fabulously halal, I mean, that's not a phrase you would have heard five or 10 years ago for sure. Um, and you may be familiar with the others, hijab chic. Again, it's cool to be a Muslim woman now, uh, which is great. And hijab delicious. Again, something that would just be impossible to say two or three years ago. These are the ways that Muslim women are using language for themselves and talking about themselves in an innovative fashion. And I think if there's something you take away, it's that kind of idea to talk about ourselves in a way that's futuristic, in a way that's forward thinking, that puts our best foot forward. There's also, if you have a look at the, the side nearest me, the lower two images, there's actually um, a lot of work being done to establish the status of Muslim women, to make people look twice and think, yeah, these women are really doing something important. So the middle one is the UK list, which is the 100 most powerful Muslim women in the UK, which again gives women a platform. It's a new way of talking about Muslim women. And again, in the bottom right, which I think some of you in this room will be on, the most 100 most powerful Arab women. Again, it, it gives a little lift so that when you're out in the, pl in the marketplace, people are going to pay attention. And that's another way that Muslim women are starting to um, adjust the, the language that's used about them. Um, just briefly, there are some trends that I see Muslim women are leading in innovation, and some of them um, are around sustainability and green issues and eco-living. So if you have a look on the top nearest me, this is um, an advert, uh, I don't know if you can see it, for Valentine's Day, which was done in Indonesia, where they were promoting green role models, which I thought was really fascinating. And in the middle at the top, there's um, a, fantastic organization, uh, a fantastic website run by a woman called Eco Muslim, and she's busy promoting awareness of ecology and the relationship with Islam. And finally, just to pick a few others out, Sun Silk, which is the two below it, is a very interesting case study of a shampoo. I don't know if any of you use Sun Silk. Um, and they kicked off a campaign, which I think is quite radical in advertising, because they market a shampoo specifically for women who wear headscarves. I mean, who knew that Muslim women who wear headscarves need a specific kind of shampoo? Um, but Sunsilk had done their research, and I think this is one of the few examples of a large organization that has actually taken time to understand what it is that Muslim women want and innovate around it. And they discovered that Muslim women who cover their hair suffer from greasiness. Um, and you can see that they've got the first shampoo. Um, and above it is a, a snapshot from the advert. And they actually have no hair in this advert at all, which is extremely unusual for a shampoo advert. They only have women with these lovely, beautiful flowing veils around them looking very excited and energetic and like they're going out to change the world, which all of you are going to do, right, after this? Good. 
Um, and then just some others. Fashion is a huge trend. It's, it's valued at $96 billion. And just to give you some context, the UK fashion market, which is one of the great fashion markets of the world, is only $21 billion. So that's a huge trend. Beneath it, we have halal cosmetics. Women, again, are saying we want our cosmetics to be in line with our, our faith. Um, and below that is halal baby food, because, of course, Muslim women still play a huge role in managing the family and in the choices they make about their children, and they really want their children to uh, uphold those faith values. Um, there's something around uh, women-only banking. So, again, women are saying we'd like to have banking services which meet the way we want to invest, um, whether that's with risk or risk averseness or with, um, without risk. Um, and then finally, just two examples that I wanted to bring up specifically around innovation in the subject of halal cosmetics. Um, there are two companies that it's worth just having a look at where women who actually became Muslim and who had previously worked in the cosmetics industry discovered that they felt that their cosmetics were not in tune with their Islamic beliefs. And this gap between what was available and what they wanted was the gap that they saw for innovation. And they created two companies. One, you can see the, the founder in the bottom left, is called Saf Skincare. And she actually markets it as an organic cosmetic. So she's extending her innovation and her own desire to solve her problem um, for halal cosmetics to a wider audience. And that's part of what Muslim women are driving. It's not just for them, it's for a wider female audience. And we see the same trend in things like modest swimwear. So that's a huge area of expansion, and maybe my, many of you might own them. But there was a great case in the UK of a famous celebrity chef, she's kind of a tier one celebrity, who was spotted, uh, photographed in one of these modest swimwear suits, which caused a hoo-ha in the UK. Um, but it just goes to show that when Muslim women do find a gap and they're going to innovate, actually that can be really appealing for a wider audience. Thank you. Thank you, Shalina. Some really... <laughs> There are some uh, really interesting marketing insights there. But obviously these are, uh, from one perspective, it's um, about capturing the opportunity with the women consumers and the women, uh, you know, Muslim consumers. I want to tie it up to innovation in a way. We have seen many ways to uh, appeal to the uh, consumer world, definitely um, uh, an eye-opener. I'm sure many of the companies are thinking of tapping into this uh, area. But what about um, unleashing the innovation potential of the women and translate into the business world? When we discussed this morning, um, you were talking about the challenges of the family life bringing into um, women's um, opportunities in the business field. Um, is there an innovation on that field itself? I, I think, when, I mean, if we were listening this morning to the, the earlier speakers and often in discussions about women and employment, there was something about a glass ceiling in the corporation. But actually, I think there is something women often impose on themselves, which is that as soon as they have a family or even as soon as they get married, somehow their participation in that sphere of innovation should stop. And I think that's totally not the case. Um, I think any woman who wants to make a change can do it and has a lot of resources at her disposal. And there's a very interesting trend in the UK, and this is the one we were talking about, where women who feel like they want to stay home to look after their children are actually starting entrepreneurial organizations while looking after their children. There's a fantastic name for it, uh, which is mumpreneur. So this is a mum who becomes an entrepreneur. Um, and I think it's very challenging. It's a very cute kind of name, uh, which makes it sound like, you know, you can be feeding your children over here and running a business over here. And, of course, that's very challenging. But I like the notion that you can be more than one thing, that you can be running a business and you can be looking after your family. And, actually, that's absolutely, totally fine. And from my own experience, um, I have uh, a two-year-old and I look after her full-time at home, but I also work full-time from home. And that was my my stipulation to Ogilvy when I started with them that I would work from home so I could look after my child. So I think there's something about setting up entrepreneurial organizations, but also working in entrepreneurial ways. 
Um, I will tell something from uh, my own company and our chairman. Uh, he mostly uh, refers Muhtar Kent, he's a Turkish fellow uh, leading Coca-Cola company uh, all around the world. And he always refers to the moment of truth that you go to market and when you pick the product that you will carry home. And all the marketing, all the innovation, all the investment is at the end um, decided upon that moment. And in most of the cases, females, the women consumers, are making that call. Uh, a huge segment of the, of the consumer expenditure is basically decided by the ladies. So there is more and more <laughs> interest in understanding the women preferences and um, you know, uh, offering products to that choice. But what about the innovation that you could lead? I mean, uh, instead of expecting someone to develop products that you will choose, the women could have the chance to decide upon producing and designing those products themselves. And that is really, we want uh, the um, innovational spirit uh, that uh, the ladies own to be translated into business. Uh, Shalina, uh, like... Um, there is, you're talking about um, ways that women can work innovatively and the innovation they create. And I mentioned Muslim fashion is like quite a big trend. Um, so as a background, it's worth noting that um, there are a couple of, of the collections um, that have just gone past in New York where actually the designers were seen to be incorporating Islamic design into their fashion trends. So there's definitely a huge influence coming from Muslim women into act to general fashion across the world. But in the UK, there was a really interesting study by... Um, uh, an organization called the London College of Fashion, which is one of the leading training organizations for design for, you know, kind of big name designers. They, they pretty much all go to London College of Fashion. And they did a study to look at the idea of modest clothing, because although Muslim women are leading it just sheer, because of sheer numbers and younger people, um, there's actually Christian and Jewish trends that are following suit, and actually women of no faith who are very interested in modest wear. And what they found in this study was that a majority of these products were being sold online, and that women were using the fact that if you'd had a shop, it would be almost commercially impossible to make a, a niche product like modest clothing, at least to start with, uh, viable. But because they could access um, a storefront on the internet, that there were multiple of these um, brands popping up. And actually, they were starting to use that to reach an international audience. And I think that was a really interesting development for that kind of modest sector to uh, kickstart its growth. Very interesting. OK, we have um, very little uh, time left, but uh, I would like to offer the opportunity uh, for, the, for the floor to ask some questions to our speaker. And interestingly, the first hand raised is from a man. <laughs> if you can get the mic, please. And after that, I would uh, expect uh, <coughs> some of the uh, ladies to join the discussion. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Eddie Meir. I'm from uh, London, England. Uh, this is my fifth conference uh, of the WIEF. And I've, I've always found women issues quite challenging and quite annoying as well. It's basically men who really put it down. And what I wanted from this conference was to, in the final communique, to put out a statement and say, set, set some goals by, say, 2015 like educating women up to the age of 18, adopt what they adopted in Norway, we have 40% of the women board members, uh, and also now the women in the villages where there's a greater problem. Women in the cities are doing quite well, uh, and that's a fact. And I was just wondering whether in the final communique we could actually have something as a goal to look forward to, say, by 2015. I would stand right behind that. I think that's one to communicate to the organizers. So it's going to be in the final communique then? I'm not part of the WIF organization, so all I can say is that I think greater education is, improves both women and wider society, so I'd, I'd stand behind that. Um, other questions? 
Do you know what it is? I think they're busy thinking about how to change the world. <laughs> yes, please. To the front row, can we take the microphone? Can you hear me? I'm Zarina. Um, I uh, came in midway. Um, unfortunately, I was sort of trying to catch the other one as well. Um, I, I, you, there's one point when you said that um, you stipulated in your arrangement with, with, your, with Ogilvy Noor that you'll be working full-time from home at the same time, full-time, taking care of the kids. Well, I think it's just like a wonderful arrangement. So maybe you could just, like, in a paragraph, how did you manage to wing that or how did you achieve that? Um, secondly, um, looking at the halal market in terms of products, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals for women, do you actually... Um, think that it's, it's um, you know, is it credible? I mean, for instance, when Sunsilk comes up with a shampoo for women with hijab, um, as a consumer, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a consultant as well, and I, and I look at um, policy projects to do with the halal development and so on, but as a consumer, my immediate reaction to that is, you know, it's the immediate thing is, hey, it's bogus. You know, you're just trying to create another niche. You're trying to sell me something I don't really need. I can use another shampoo. And it doesn't matter whether I'm wearing hijab or not. It's just it, a way to differentiate your product. And, you know, and, and I don't want to f um, succumb to that. Do you think there's credibility, real research done where there's really a need or, you know, for products? For, and, and do you think it's an upward trend? Is it some, it's kind of emerging um, new... Uh, um, business idea model, if you like, and you, and you would re recommend it. Thank you. So I'm going to ask, answer the second one first, if that's okay. It's actually a really good question about the general market trend about products that are called halal or called Islamic. And one of the key findings about the futurists is that they don't take things at face value. So if something says Islamic, they want to know why. Why is it Islamic? What makes it Islamic? How dare you make this claim that it's Islamic? I'm going to check. I'm going to call up six customer service people and your website and go into the shop and ask. And I think that's a really good trait, you know, that kind of level of rigor. So you can't just plaster the label Islamic or halal onto a product, that's for sure. And I think any product that does do that will certainly fall foul of this claim that it's bogus. Now, the reason I pick Sunsilk is that. Genuinely, I feel that this is a product that Muslim women who cover their hair will, will feel is a need for them. And um, I, I don't know where you came in. When I was talking about it, there were a lot of kind of heading, nodding heads, like, yeah, this product is for me. Because I think they've actually taken time to understand properly what it is that Muslim women need. I don't think it's a case of, we've got a product, we need to sell a bit more. You know, how do we, how do we put a, a logo on it? And I think that is the kind of development and innovation that we want to see from organizations that are actually genuinely serving needs. Now, as to my own working arrangements, okay, this is just kind of between us. Don't tell any Ogilvy people. Um, so they, they offered me the role when I was eight months pregnant um, because I have a background in marketing and product marketing and also, as you've seen, with Muslim engagement. So it was, it was quite a nice match. And, and so my stipulation was that I would need to work from home because I had a small, well, I didn't even have a baby then. Um, I was going to have a small baby, inshallah. Um, and they were very accommodating of that. Now, not all industries can be, um, you know, it's worth saying that, but the particular industry I work in, in is. But I also always go away with this as my motto, which is that, is what, that was my aspiration, that I wanted to work because I enjoy it um, and it's challenging and this role was perfect. Um, but I also wanted to stay home and look after my child at least for a certain period. And I always have this motto, um, which is, if you don't ask, you don't get. So my view was, I'm going to ask. What's the worst that will happen? They'll say, you have to go to the office. I mean, that's really no loss. So I asked, and, you know, and I was very fortunate that they accepted. Um, but the other thing is, and I think generally women find this really hard to do, um, is to understand your own value, to know what it is you bring to the organization, and to understand that they, it's a relationship with the organization and that you're bringing value to them, and in return, they need to be somewhat accommodating to your own circumstances. So I'd say if you if, have an aspiration of what you want, and go for it, and what's the worst that will happen? They'll, they'll say no, you're not going to be any worse off. 
Thank you, Shalina. Do we have one last question, please? Uh, the lady at the third row, the side, can you pass the mic? Um, hi, I'm um, Salam alaikum. I'm Jana from Singapore. I just want to know, can I buy your book here? <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually genuinely don't know the answer to that. I know that it's available in Singapore because I was lecturing there earlier in the year in Arab Street, apparently. Um, I don't know if it's available in, in Malaysia. I, I, I would mean, guess today, some of the organizers. Today, <laughs> today um, I don't know. <laughs> the organizers might be able to help you, sorry. Uh, I think you should uh, check the internet. Um, we want to conclude this um, discussion and thank you uh, for your interest, for your time and listening. Uh, as conclusion, I would like to uh, combine a message I just heard at the, uh, at the second hall, in fact, during the session just uh, before us. Um, when they were discussing about entrepreneurship, um, the speaker there said, to be a successful entrepreneur, you need to have a good idea and you need to have a need in the market to, to apply that. In fact, Shalina's presentation was a really scientific way of explaining that, that uh, principle because there's definitely a need and as long as uh, you uh, find the idea, there is a lot of innovation opportunities uh, and obviously great uh, demand in the, in the market for this kind of products and thinking. So I hope um, you will uh, get the benefit of um, uh, you know, investing some time about elaborating, thinking about this presentation. Shalina, thank you so much for the uh, discussion. Do you have any uh, final uh, comments to make before we close? I guess I have to ask this question. How many of you now feel like you're going to change the world? Just a little bit. Oh, really? Come on. You had more in the, in beginning, the beginning of the... <laughs> no, thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Kadri Ozen, as well as Michelina Jan Mohammed, and um, in true uh, tradition, we'd like to invite both for a photograph to be recorded as uh, part of the event. If you'd like to stand up and uh, look at our photograph, is uh, take a snap of you.